We've all experienced those moments when life throws you a curveball. Maybe you've had an unexpected medical expense or got into a fender bender. The worst part is not having the money to pay for it right away. That's where the banking app Dave comes in. It's like having a financial safety net that can get you out of those tight spots when you really need it. With Dave, you could get up to $500 instantly with their extra cash feature. Yes, you heard that right. Up to $500 without any interest, late fees, or credit checks. Imagine having that extra cushion to fill your tank, finally get your car repaired, or catch up on bills without having to wait for your next paycheck. It's a game changer. Now I know what you're thinking. Is Dave just another app that promises the world but falls short? Well, let me tell you. Millions of people have already downloaded the Dave app and have experienced the financial relief they desperately needed. Dave is the real deal. So, if you're tired of living paycheck to paycheck and need some extra help, don't wait any longer. Download Dave today and think of it as a helping hand from future you. To get started, simply go to dave.com slash let's read. That's dave.com slash let's read. And sign up for an extra cash account and get up to $500 instantly. For terms and conditions, be sure to visit dave.com slash legal. Please note that instant transfer fees apply. Dave's banking services are provided by Evolve, member FDIC. My mother was stationed at Kadena Air Force Base around the late 2010s, and being a military child at the age of 12, my life had reset once again. I didn't have friends again, and I had to learn an entire new neighborhood. I didn't really have anything that made me ecstatic. That is, except the Pokemon League held on base. It was ran by a few people who earned their judge cards from Nintendo and held tournaments and just open game nights. It was really fun picking up the card game, and they even had a small gym and Elite Four system. I made a lot of friends, and one of them was one of the judges, who I am thankful still to this day, because if it wasn't for him, I may not be here right now. The judge in question, who we will call Professor Getsu for the sake of anonymity, was a nice dude. He was the youngest of three and wore a white professor getup. He looked maybe on the edge of his teens, early twenties with dark hair and glasses and a skinny frame. He was extremely helpful to newcomers, sort of like the big brother we could all look up to and strive to beat in our children's cars and video games, even if his game name of Getsu was a bit nerdy even for me. He was always one of the last people to leave, helped to clean up, and he supposedly lived nearby. This last thing is important for what's about to happen. It was a bit of a colder night when the event ended. I was sitting outside in the parking lot, scrolling through memes my friends texted me as I waited for my parents to arrive to pick me up. I was just kind of zoning out as the time clicked by when I heard someone nearby. Hey. Hey, girly. You play Pokemon? I would look up at some really big dude, kind of chubby looking. I saw him every now and then, the events, and he didn't really stand out too much. I gave him a small nod and said, Yeah, I do. As he gives me this wide smile, he starts walking forward and I'm hit with this nasty stench, like bad body odor. I blink a bit as I see that he's walking from a black sedan with its back door open. I got this cool car collection. Come here, let me show you. Now my parents have always taught me about stranger danger, but my kid brain thought, hey, he went to events and I've seen him there, so he should be fine. At least so I thought until he grabbed my wrist and started to drag me to the sedan. To say that I immediately started screaming is an understatement. Stinky didn't care though, he was still dragging me saying how I'll have fun and throwing out things about trading cards like someone listening would think that he was dealing with a whiny kid. I honestly thought that I was going to be taken and would never see my mom and dad again, like being on the back of a milk carton and disappearing forever. Silly, I know, but I was sheltered about dying and death at that time. Thankfully, Professor Getsu walked out at that very moment, presumably on his way home. All I know is I heard the sound of fabric hitting the guy's face as the professor swung his professor coat right into it. 
I felt his hand go to where the guy was grabbing my arm and I saw his hand grab Stinky's pinky finger and yank back. Stinky let go and yowled like an animal as Professor pushed me back behind him while he pulled his coat off the guy. Then he kicked the back of the guy's knees, causing him to buckle and grabbed his wrists, pulling back on them. Stinky groaned in even more pain as Professor looked at him with a cold look in his eyes. The big brother figure was gone, replaced by something else, and I think I was a bit scared of it. The professor's tone of voice when he spoke didn't help either. His words lingered like icy daggers against Stinky. If I see you back here doing this to my charges, what Japanese prisons will do to you will pale in comparison. Stinky scrambled away, got into his car and peeled out of the parking lot. The professor glared at him until he was out of sight. Then he guided me inside the venue, bought me some fish and chips, and sat down with me until my parents arrived. That cold persona that he had when he confronted that guy was gone, and he was back to being the big brother that I knew. To be frank, it frightened me. I didn't quite understand why the teenager was so aggressive. I only later learned that Professor Getsu was a black belt who taught kids how to defend themselves with his mother at the local activity center. I suspect that he had a protective persona and something in his own life led him to act that way. He explained the situation to my folks when they arrived. I wasn't allowed to attend the events and league as often as I used to, but I still did from time to time. Professor Getsu continued to be his normal self of the events, helping people, but he stopped coming a year later when his license expired and his father moved out of the country. Being around the same age as he was, and now with a younger sibling of my own, I sympathized with how, for a brief moment, he became something terrifying just to ensure my safety. As for Stinky, he never showed up to the events again. He was either banned or simply scared of Professor Getsu. I wish the professor a good life and hope he's doing well. As for Stinky, I hope you get some help. My mom was born and raised in the high country of East Central Montana. She came from ranching people and her father, my grandfather, was a genuine cowboy. He often worked around the ranch with her, so not much shakes her to her soul, except for what happened when she had to run into town when I was only eight months old. This incident occurred in the middle of a sunny summer day. The ranch where she was raised was nearly two hours away from the nearest town. To reach the ranch, one had to drive north on a highway for about 30 minutes, followed by a 45-minute drive on a dirt road across the Montana high country. I emphasize this because it highlights not only the remote location she lived in at the time, but also why the story becomes so disturbing. My mom had to go to town to buy groceries and baby supplies for me. While driving back to the ranch on the long and isolated dirt road, she reached into her purse on the passenger seat to retrieve something. Unfortunately, it slipped out of her hand and fell into the passenger footwell. Naturally, she had to stop the car to safely retrieve the item, and after grabbing it and sitting back up, she glanced into the rearview mirror and saw a man, about a hundred feet behind the car, running toward her. Without hesitation, she immediately put the car back into gear and fled. As she checked on me in the car seat, making sure that I was okay, she saw the man give up the pursuit and disappear into the ditch to hide. Upon arriving home, she shared what happened with her parents, my grandparents, and they were stunned. And here's where it becomes psychologically disturbing. Throughout the entire journey on the dirt road, my mom didn't encounter any parked cars or trucks, nor did she see any people walking alongside the highway or dirt road. This raises even more questions. How did the man get out there? Why was he there? And even more unsettling, what could he have done to my mom or to an eight-month-old like me? The more I thought about it, the more disturbing it became, my mom would say. I've only asked my mom about this story twice. After the second time, she asked me never to bring it up again, and I fully understand why. It disturbs me just to think about it, so I can only imagine how she felt having directly experienced it. Firstly, this incident occurred in the remote area of Montana high country far away from any populated areas. It's 
an open grassland with low rolling hills where the only signs of human activity are fence posts and perhaps a windmill or an old abandoned barn or house. I highlight this because some comments suggest that my mom should have simply called the police. Well, there's no police out there in the Montana high country. They exist in the small towns where she went for groceries, but good luck finding assistance out in that remote area. That's why people who live there often carry firearms to handle unexpected situations on the spot. Interpret that as you will. And secondly, some comments point out that the interesting coincidence of my mom stopping her car near the spot where the man was hiding. Again, strange things happen out in the middle of nowhere and coincidences occur. Who knows why that man was there? Rural Montana is not a place where people casually hang out. Unless you live there, know someone who lives there, or have business with someone there, you shouldn't be going there for any reason. Furthermore, my mom didn't encounter anyone walking on the highway or the dirt road, nor did she see any parked vehicles along the side. If someone managed to reach that far on foot, there's no one you should be interacting with. Back then, my mom was a small 19-year-old woman with her 8-month-old infant in the back seat when this happened. I highly doubt that she could have been of any help to him. We will never know why this guy was out there and frankly, I don't think that we ever want to. Back when I was in college in Texas, my roommates and I decided to drive to Boulder, Colorado for spring break. To maximize our time in Boulder, we decided to take shifts and drive all the way through rather than stopping for overnight stays. It was roughly an 18-hour trip. So I'm driving my shift when we reach the Texas Panhandle in the early morning hours. We're out in the middle of nowhere and have not seen a single car in either direction for ages when we notice headlights behind us. The car came up to us quickly, then followed behind us for some time. Oddly, it would get real close to us and then back off real far and then get close to us again. This pattern continued for several miles. We're in the car nervously joking about it being a potential deliverance situation set in Texas flatland. Suddenly, the headlights are joined by red and blue police lights. It was so dark out there that we had not seen the light bar on the hood and had not realized that we were being followed by a cop. I check my speedometer and I'm not speeding so we're all wondering why we're getting pulled over, but I go ahead and pull to the shoulder. Up comes a cop wearing a cowboy hat to my window. He shines his light in the car and looks us over, then asks me to get out of the car. I hesitate at first, but there are three other people in the car, so I'm not feeling particularly unsafe at this point. I grab my wallet, get out, and stand against the driver door. The cop looks at my license and insurance, and then tells me he's going to do a sobriety test. I'm thinking, what? But I know that I've had nothing to drink, so I say okay. The way the cop directed me for the walking in a straight line test had me ending my walk right by his car. When I finished, he reached over to open his back passenger door and then told me to get in. What? Why? Sit in the car while I look up your license. No, I had heard how doors in the back of a cop car only open from the outside so I know if I get in that car and he closes the door I won't be able to get out. It's like 3 in the morning, pitch black darkness on a road dozens of miles from any civilization. I'm not getting in that car. Uh, I'm sorry sir but with all due respect and for my own safety I, I'm not getting into the back of your car. What did you say to me? Me repeating what I said. For my own safety, with all due respect, I'm not sitting in the back of your car. You can call another officer to come out here, but I do not feel safe getting in your car. Do you realize I could arrest you right now for not obeying an order from a police officer? Again, sir, I'm not meaning to be disrespectful. I'm just not getting in your car. We go back and forth like this for several minutes. Him threatening to arrest me, my friends, holding us overnight, etc, etc, and me refusing to get in his car. The cop then leers at me and asks, What? Are you afraid of being kidnapped? What? How do you even ask that? I glance towards my car and see my friends piled up at the back window watching, the two guys looking ready to jump out. 
the cop turns to look at them too. I don't know what went through his mind, but after being completely aggressive with me for what seemed forever, he finally gave me this creepy smile, handed me back my license and insurance, tipped his hat, and then got into the car and drove off. At this point, I was shaking so badly that my friends had to help me get back in the car. I don't even remember if he gave me a ticket. I was so glad that I had not cried in front of this idiot, but I totally broke down once in the back seat. To this day, I think about this freak deciding to terrorize a young college female at 3 a.m. in the middle of rural Texas, and I often wonder what would have happened if I had not stood my ground and, instead, gotten into that cop car. This happened a few years ago, but upon discovering this sub, it reminded me of that incident and I wanted to share it here. The year was 2018 and me and three other friends, we were all males in our early 20s, decided to travel to Bali for about a week since it was cheap and we had time, so why not? Our itinerary included sightseeing, trying local foods, mountain climbing, visiting bars at the beach, basically a typical vacation in Indonesia. It was honestly quite a surreal experience. The country is absolutely beautiful and the food was amazing. The only issue I had about the trip were the locals. Drugs were really prominent there, especially mushrooms. The streets were filled with druggies dying to sell us drugs. I'm not exaggerating when I say this. One dude even grabbed my arm because I ignored his two for one deal for a one-way trip to meet Jesus, as he put it. I shrugged him off while my friends laughed it off, suggesting that I maybe passing up a chance to meet our lord and savior. He looked rabid and frantic, like he was about to pounce on me like a dog diagnosed with rabies. I didn't feel too afraid as we were confident that we could handle them since half of them were not even sober. However, that is only the tip of the iceberg. The horror starts when we went back to our Airbnb for the night. We had an early day the next morning and were exhausted. The place was extremely cheap and a didn't even have a proper locking mechanism for the door. It had two wooden doors which swing inwards and the only way to lock them was to wedge a wooden block through the holes mounted on the door. It was quite a primitive lock but it gets the job done I guess. Everything was going well until the last night of our trip when we realized that the wooden block was missing. We looked everywhere but to no avail. I just figured that one of us must have misplaced it somewhere. We settled for using a selfie stick. I know it sounds like a horrible idea. Instead, since we didn't have anything that fits the holes to wedge the door closed. We turn in for the night, seemingly not expecting anything since we had already stayed there for six days with no issues. I woke up to strange clicking sounds in the dead of the night. I got out of bed and I thought maybe it's one of the guys, so I nonchalantly approached the noise. My friends were all sleeping, so I decided to investigate the cause of this noise. The ruckus seemed to be coming from the door, so I headed towards them, feeling extremely confused. Who would be at our doorstep at this time of the night? I noticed the doors were slightly opened and the selfie stick was horribly deformed. I peeked outside, and I saw three people staring through the gap between the doors. They were really close to the entrance and were attempting to push the doors open. I yelled at them, questioning their intentions as I noticed one of them was holding the wooden block. I was shocked and puzzled at the situation as I recognized one of the men. He did the overall cleaning for the Airbnbs and pathways during the day so there is no reason for him to be there at 3am. The other dude asked if the wooden block belonged to us as they allegedly found it outside of our Airbnb. I definitely smelled some BS as there was absolutely no reason to do that in the middle of the night. I called for my guys and the three men immediately ran for it. I clue in the guys on the circumstances and we stayed up until the morning in case they tried anything funny again. We decided to report to reception about their employee but the descriptions I gave them were not synonymous with theirs. They told me the housekeepers they hired consisted of only females in their late 30s and 40s. This sent shivers down our spines as we came to realize that we had let a complete imposter in and out of our rooms while we were out. Luckily, nothing important was lost and we got out of the situation safely. 
I can't imagine what would have happened if I didn't wake up that night as the doors were close to being opened. I was just grateful that it was our last night there. I want to start by saying that this might be a little out of order as it happened over 10 years ago and it's a bit vague in my memory now. However, everything I'm about to share is completely true and after reading so many posts on this thread, I knew I wanted to share my story. My grandma lives in the worst part of our town, plagued by shootings and drug activity. Despite the neighborhood's dangers, I always felt safe and protected at my grandma's house where I spent most of my childhood. Even now, at 81 years old, she still resides there. My cousin, who was a year older than me, and I would frequently visit my grandma's house and she would babysit us. At the ages of four to six, we were just beginning to build our friendship. Our mothers would go to work, and since we couldn't stay home alone, we would stay at my grandma's. I don't recall the exact frequency of our visits, but we spent enough time there. Occasionally, my grandma had to run errands, and during those times, she would have her neighbor, an elderly woman whom we'll refer to as N, come over and stay with us for a short while. Ann and my grandma were friends, so she would sometimes visit even when my grandma was home. She would play with us, and she was always sweet and kind. She never made me feel uncomfortable or acted inappropriately. My grandma trusted and adored her. Now fast forward a few years, my cousin and I were around 9 to 12 years old, and my grandma started having us stay overnight for a few nights. It was the best part of my childhood. We could stay up late, eat whatever we wanted, listen to loud music, and play video games. We were well aware of the neighborhood's dangers, so we always kept the doors locked and the curtains remained closed at night. Anne lived in the house on the left of my grandma's, while a new person, who we'll call C, moved in on the right. I remember my grandma warning us to stay away from him, describing him as a bad person and a child predator. When my mom dropped me off at my grandma's, I would see him sitting on his porch. I remember he wore an ankle monitor as if he were on house arrest or something. And this is the part that creeps me out. The first time I saw C after my grandma's warning, I tried to look away, but his face is forever engraved in my mind as resembling the sloth character from the Goonies. Now that I'm older, I understand that my childlike mind may have distorted his appearance, but I am absolutely certain that he had a deformed face. He had slightly longer brown hair, one eye placed higher than the other and a bulging forehead. He walked and spoke oddly with a low, grumpy voice like sloth. Needless to say, I was terrified of him and his appearance, even at that young age. I had a keen sense of danger and knew to avoid certain people, thankfully. As I mentioned earlier, I would hide behind my mom whenever she walked me to my grandma's house. Sometimes she would greet us with a friendly, Hey, how are you guys today? But we never acknowledged him. When my grandma came out into the porch, she would politely greet her, but she completely ignored him and my cousin and I followed suit. One time we were playing in the backyard when C came outside and we immediately rushed indoors. I felt sad that we had to live in fear and completely avoid this person instead of enjoying our normal lives. Whatever C did was probably worse than what my grandma just told us. She gave us a basic rundown saying, he touched little kids and did bad stuff with them. And now that we're older, we can fill in the blanks to some extent. At that time, we were around 12 years old, and somehow N and C had become close. Later, I found out that N was a religious fanatic and started taking C to church. It was strange how they started hanging out together. N was at least 65 years old, while C was only in his 40s, which seemed odd given the circumstances. Once my grandma learned about their spending time together, she unfriended Anne and prevented her from seeing us. Anne would call my grandma and insist that C has changed, he's a different person now. However, my grandma wanted nothing to do with it and refused to let us be near someone who associated with a child predator. At some point, Anne called my grandma again, attempting to have a normal conversation. She asked if she could have recent pictures of me and my cousin from school to display in her house. I assumed that she had already had old pictures of us when we were much younger and wanted more up-to-date ones now that we were almost in middle school. My grandma firmly declined, citing C's frequent visits to N's house. She also requested that N return the pictures that she already had. 
Then, N and C got married. Anne even called my grandma to ask for her permission, but she completely disagreed and couldn't believe it. However, my grandma knew her response wouldn't change their minds. They married and moved away together. It's unfortunate because our perception of Anne changed completely after that. Now, at 20 years old, I find it truly terrible that she did that. It's strange to think about. Having the exact details about C, what he did, and how long he was in prison would probably be helpful, but unfortunately I don't know those specifics. If I do some digging, I might be able to uncover some more information since I'm really curious after writing all of this. C's face has been etched into my memory. I know it's a bizarre description, but it's somewhat accurate. To this day, I'm immensely grateful that my grandma did what she did for my cousin and me. After they moved away, we could return to our normal lives without living in fear of being watched outside. We even worried about him attempting to break in or peep through the windows at night. It was strange how friendly he was and why he was so eagerly wanting to befriend my grandma. I also find it deeply unsettling that someone like N, who was around children so much, would even consider trusting a child predator and try to expose him to us. I have no idea about their current status, but that's something I intend to figure out after writing all of this. I worked as a child care professional and one of the kids I look after has recently taken an interest in hiking. I decided to take him to a cool trail in Salt Fork State Park. We parked near the trailhead and were ready to hike to Hosack's Cave. The trail is about half a mile long, which is why I chose it for our hike that day. I also selected this trail because it was usually busy and popular, making me feel secure. However, severe summer storms last year caused significant damage to the trail. To my surprise, it was much more difficult and completely empty. The empty trail didn't bother me much because there was a small construction crew working on a nearby bridge. Despite the challenging conditions, he was still enthusiastic about the hike. We made it to a platform where we could see the entire cave. Although the platform was closed, we decided to maneuver around it and continue into the cave. This area proved to be the most challenging, but we spent a significant amount of time there. I remember it well. The platform had tree roots underneath, which served as a climbable path down. It's worth noting that Hosack's cave is more like a cliff with an overhanging rock formation and a small waterfall in the middle. It's an open and beautiful place, not a closed up cave. At the cave I noticed an unlit candle sitting on a large rock with a heart carved into it. I didn't think much of it, assuming someone had a romantic outing there. As we climbed to the top, I spotted two more candles and three stacks of small rocks, presumably placed by someone else. It started to feel strange, but at that moment, the kid that I was with found a small puddle full of baby salamanders and wanted to catch them. Seeing his happiness, I couldn't bring myself to end the adventure. We spent about an hour catching salamanders and I watched him have the time of his life. When we decided to leave, we noticed a wet washcloth hanging among the tree roots in the platform center. It wasn't there before. He noticed it too, but didn't grasp the seriousness of the situation that we might be in. At that moment, I realized two things for sure. First, someone had been watching us without our knowledge. Second, they were potentially hiding in the woods, deliberately leaving objects for us to notice. Running back on the narrow trail was not an option and I didn't want to alarm him about the potential danger. I instructed him to walk ahead of me, continually encouraging him, and this naturally sped up his pace. During our time on the trail, I never saw anyone. As we reached the car, I immediately locked the doors. On our way out of the park, a dirty looking man, probably in his thirties, emerged from the woods. He stared at me with an expressionless face, following me with his eyes until I couldn't see him anymore. This encounter confirmed the third fact. He purposely made himself visible to me, affirming the previous two facts. That stare haunted me for days, caused me severe anxiety. I even considered seeking counseling because it deeply disturbed me for weeks. I tried to convince myself that perhaps he was just startled during his bath time or camping nearby. After all, he had more than enough opportunities to do something while we were occupied with the salamanders. But I can't rationalize why he stared into my eyes the way he did if he wanted to go unnoticed. 
Deep down, I know it was a deliberate attempt to frighten me. The kid that I was with had no idea about the panic that I felt, and to this day, it remains the most joyful experience I have witnessed him have. He brings it up regularly, and it was a very positive experience for him. But it was one of the worst experiences I've ever had, and it made me feel so sick and disturbed. Three to four years ago, during my first year of college, I took night classes since they were more common at the college I attended. I had two night classes each week along with two early morning classes three times a week, one of which was a lab. During the second week of my Monday night class, the professor assigned us into groups for our final project. Our task was to research and create a PowerPoint presentation summarizing what we had learned throughout the course. We could meet in class every two weeks to work on the project and we were also allowed to meet outside of class. After being assigned to a group with four other students, we exchanged names and went our separate ways. The following week, I received a Facebook message from a guy in my final group project. He mentioned having a question about the class so I asked him what it was. He quickly figured it out and I didn't respond. A few minutes later he messaged me again asking for the contact information of the other group members so he could add them on Facebook. I assumed that he wanted to create a group chat for us but I noticed that that never happened. For the next meeting we agreed to meet outside of class since we didn't have enough time in class to discuss everything. However when the time came only he and I showed up. Instead of discussing the project he started talking about his ex. Unsure of what to do, I listened and offered advice while working on assignments for my other classes. After that, he started showing up at my study area. Several weeks went by and I didn't mind him coming to talk to me whenever he needed to vent or seek advice. I had become used to it. One night during my Wednesday night class, I received a message from him asking me to have dinner with him. I told him I couldn't because I was in class and had plans afterwards. He persisted, saying it was just dinner and that he had no one else to eat with. I simply responded, no, I have other things to do after class. However, he kept insisting and accused me of making excuses to avoid going out with him. Truthfully, I didn't want to go, but I also had a family member in the hospital and needed to visit them during that time. After declining his invitation, I stopped attending class because his behavior had started to creep me out. He always sat next to me in class and constantly asked me to have lunch or dinner with him. He was persistent even when I told him I needed to study or had other plans. Eventually he messaged me and revealed that he knew where my mom worked. When I asked how he found out, he claimed to have seen someone who looked like me but older and it turned out to be my mom. A week later we ran into each other at a store while my mom and I were shopping. My mom asked who he was and I replied, just a guy from class who really creeps me out. She also urged me to give him a chance and date him because he was handsome. I expressed my discomfort and asked her to stop discussing it. By the end of the semester, with about two weeks remaining, I still hadn't returned to my Monday night class. I felt thoroughly creeped out at that point. He continually messaged me and persistently tried to arrange meals together, even after I had said no multiple times. One morning, I walked out of my morning class and noticed his backpack on the floor near the stairs. He had been sitting there alone. Feeling incredibly anxious, I quietly retreated and used a different staircase. My anxiety was very high, so I left campus and called my cousin to pick me up since my mom had driven me to school that morning. After explaining the situation to my cousin, they advised me to transfer and file a report. However, I didn't end up filing a report because I had stopped seeing him around after blocking him everywhere. Two years ago, I had joined a group at a different university where we performed in front of a live audience. I had stopped attending these events out of fear of running into him. Eventually, I felt it was safe to go since my sister would be with me and I had started dating someone who is now my ex. While we were performing at college, I noticed a familiar face in the crowd, watching me. I couldn't see clearly since I wasn't wearing my glasses, but I could sense him staring at me from the far right. After my performance, I confided in my lead about feeling unsafe. I also told my sister and my ex-boyfriend being surrounded by friends made me feel safer than when I was alone. I thought I was in a secure situation, but as I walked back into the room to get my jacket, he started walking towards me, staring intently. 
In my panic, I turned around and unfortunately, I tripped. I no longer wear those heels, by the way. Surprisingly, my ex-boyfriend was right behind me and caught me. He asked where I was going and upon hearing about the stalker, he advised me to not go anywhere alone in case something happened. He guided me to a safe spot and shielded me until the man passed by. A few months after that incident, he unexpectedly applied to attend the spring retreat for the school organization that I was a part of. He even tried to add me on Instagram, but ungrateful, I decided not to go to that retreat. It would have been a horrible three days of my life. One night, my boyfriend and I were watching a movie in the living room when there was a knock on the door. I was eight months pregnant and we were both around 27 years old. My kids, age five and seven, were sleeping down the hall. My boyfriend peeked out the window and we saw that it was Roger. We had met Roger a few months before when we helped him with some flooring in his kitchen. We also had chatted outside a few times. He was in his 50s or 60s, very nice and lived alone. There was no bad vibes from him, although he mentioned that he was a dealer and had pounds of weed in his car. We didn't take it too seriously, thinking that he was just joking. Now back to the story, we opened the door. It was late and dark and at that moment, I still saw Roger as a nice little old man. However, as soon as the door opened, he barged inside. I immediately sensed that something was off about him. The layout of our house was such that the living room led to the front door, which in turn led to the kitchen with the hallway next to the kitchen table. It was a very small space. Before he sat down in the kitchen next to the hallway entrance, I noticed a huge hunting knife and a baseball bat tucked into his pants under his sweatshirt. I was shocked and didn't know what to do. My boyfriend sat across from Roger, asking him if he was okay or he needed help. Roger started getting agitated and began yelling about the people at his house not being happy with us. He was upset about the flooring that we had helped him with in the summer. I still had no idea what was going on, but it seemed like he was believing that the floor wasn't done and he wanted my boyfriend to go with him immediately to fix it, or else the people at his house would be angry. He brought up my kids and we got into an argument. I told him that they were sleeping and that he needed to leave now and my boyfriend refused to go anywhere. Unaware of the weapons, my boyfriend saw the situation escalating and attempted to defuse it by agreeing to go with Roger. The plan was to get Roger out the door and lock it behind him. They reached the door and opened it, and just as my boyfriend turned to look at me, Roger unexpectedly pushed him hard, causing him to stumble into the doorway. Roger immediately slammed the door shut, leaving me alone. I called 911 while I heard yelling outside. The operator instructed me to go outside, but I hesitated because Roger had a giant knife and I felt helpless. Eventually, I went out to my deck, but they were gone and it hadn't even been a minute. I stood there in shock and fear. Time passed and suddenly there was a frantic pounding on the door. Luckily, it was my boyfriend. I opened the door and he rushed in with wide eyes and this mysterious axe that he found. Both the 911 operator and I were bewildered and asked him what had happened. Apparently, as soon as they reached the road, Roger pulled out the knife and he began yelling threats saying that he would cut your head off for the people at my house. My boyfriend immediately fled from there, running through yards to get back home and grabbing an axe along the way. The RCMP arrived and we had a court date. However, we ended up waiting outside the courtroom until we were informed that it was over. Roger was present, wearing an oversized suit. He lived in the same cul-de-sac as us and my kids would wait for the bus where he walked by. No one ever told us if he was arrested or when he was released. We eventually just moved. I have just been reminded by my Facebook memories of an encounter I had five years ago, so I thought I'd go ahead and post it here. So five years ago, I was a backpacker who had recently arrived in Melbourne, Australia. It was my fifth day in the city and I spent my mornings applying to every job offer that matched my skill set and my afternoons exploring the new city. At that point, I was nearing the end of my stay in Australia, with about four months left on my two-year visa. I had met all kinds of people during my travels and experienced a few memorable characters. 
but this one still stands out to me even after all these years. My job search was quite broad. I had already done my farm work, worked a few shifts in the hospitality industry, and had a trial lined up as a retail assistant. Unfortunately, that trial fell through when the guy only paid me about $40 for a whole day's worth of work, and that's when I realized that there were probably better paying and more secure jobs out there that were also legal and didn't involve sketchy employers. Back home in Germany, I had a background in administration and office management within the IT industry. In the past, I had managed to secure positions that wouldn't typically consider backpackers, so that was my goal for Melbourne. I applied for numerous admin assistant roles, any type of entry level office management, executive assistants, personal assistants, receptionists, you name it. I even signed up with several recruiting agencies to increase my chances. One day I came across an advertisement looking for an executive assistant to a senior leadership management position. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. It contained a detailed description of the role and stated the name of the company, which was a small legal firm. At that stage, I had already applied for around 50 jobs, so they all started blending together. So I wrote a cover letter, attached my CV, and applied. About seven minutes later, I received a call. It was the management member himself calling me directly. That struck me as strange, since it wasn't something I came across very often. I thought maybe it was just a small company. The conversation started off as usual for the first five minutes. He introduced himself as John Smith and talked about the position and its expectations. And then it took a weird turn, and here's the dialogue. So, uh, you'd be required to wear a uniform, you okay with that? Yeah, that's totally fine. Well, we'll get you to try on the uniform when you come in for your interview. I'll order it now. What's your size? Oh, um, well, my tops are size L and the pants XL will do. So you're bigger then? Y y yup. Do you know your waist measurements? How much do you weigh? Um, just XL for pants, that's usually fine. And top? W what's your bra size? Oh, that's an awfully personal question for an interview, don't you think? Is it like double D or something? I, I need to know as your superior, I want to get it right. Are you free for an interview today? Uh, okay. Naturally, I found this very strange. I had encountered some creepy Australian men before, but rarely in a professional setting. However, I agreed to the interview since I was desperate for a job and had no other option lined up. He said he would text me the address. About five minutes later, he called me back. Are you free to come in to interview today after 9 p.m.? I'd like to discuss this with you over dinner. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I would have had dinner by that point, but I can still come and meet you. Okay. Do you drink? Yes, I prefer to drink only a little, though. What will you be wearing? What are you wearing currently? Do you have proper interview clothes? Uh, I do have proper interview clothes, yes. I, I don't see how what I'm currently wearing is relevant. Do you realize you really have to impress me tonight? I mean, you really have to. I'm sure you've impressed your boss before, right? I said, yeah, sure, and he proceeded to text me the address. I looked it up and it was about 40 minutes from the company's official address listed on their website near a train station. Needless to say, all my alarm bells were going off, but I was still determined to go because I was running low on savings. I decided I would go early and scope out the train station. Is the area well lit? Are there routes to escape? Are there people around? Are there shops and bars nearby? While I was researching the area, he called me again. Hey, do you drink? Yes, as I said before. Now tell me exactly what you'll be wearing. Sir, I, I haven't really decided. Okay then. Well, I require you to send me a photo of you right now. We'll see you tonight at the train station. I'm sorry, my camera's broken, but I, I'll see you tonight. My camera wasn't actually broken, I just wanted to get off the phone ASAP. And about three hours before the interview, I got on the tram and took the hour-long journey to the train station. On the way in there, it got quieter and quieter until eventually there were no more people around, even shortly after rush hour. I wore a tight-fitting outfit, 
one you couldn't rip off, so to speak. Messaged a few friends about where I was going and who I was meeting. Finally, I decided a job wasn't worth my life, so I texted him that I was very uncomfortable meeting him in this location this late, and it didn't seem professional to me. And he replied that I was missing out and that I'll regret it. I blocked his number and went back into the city. It's still the strangest encounter I've ever had, and I'm so glad I never met that guy. In hindsight, I wish I had contacted the company about him, but alas, as a backpacker in my early 20s, it just never occurred to me. I'm a petite, pale female, I'm 22, and I've got quite messy hair. I was wearing loose white clothes, you might guess where I'm heading. Outside, sitting in a chair in my front yard, I was smoking. Let me mention that I live in the countryside with fields and forests leading from my street. Nights here have a unique vibe if you catch my drift. The sky presents magnificent masterpieces for our starry eyes. So, I was completely absorbed in the sky, then I stood up to take a picture. I wanted to capture it to reproduce through painting. However, my disappointment grew when I realized my camera was very inadequate. Therefore, I decided to go inside and grab one of my parents' phones since they had better quality. While attempting to take some pictures, I felt someone's gaze on me. It was my new neighbor, staring at me from her house, which was just across from the front garden. I had been waiting, taking advantage of the automatic light in my yard that flashes with any movement and lasts for about 20 seconds, an important detail. And thus, I was only visible for a brief moment, and then it was pitch dark again. There are no street lights where I live, so I felt relieved, thinking I was invisible. In that moment, as I continued to capture mesmerizing shots, the flash in the phone that I was holding unexpectedly illuminated. The moon was positioned right beside her house, making it appear as though I was photographing her home. I heard her scream, so I quickly covered the flashlight and turned it off. I was petrified, uncertain about the best course of action. Should I, A, immediately flee to my house, risking reactivating the flash and looking suspicious? B, confront her, taking the opportunity to explain the situation while also initiating our first conversation, as I had unintentionally scared her on previous occasions, which I'll explain later, or C, disappear into the darkness and wait. Okay, let me explain. I'm a night owl who loves art. It's not uncommon to find me outside, right in front of my house or in the middle of the driveway taking pictures, smoking, or simply contemplating even past midnight. So I had unintentionally startled her multiple times. I know this because she referred to me as the weird neighbor to someone. One day I was playing with my cat in the front yard using a red laser light, late at night of course. Accidentally, the laser beam landed on one of her windows, causing a flashy red light point to appear. She screamed, turned on the lights in the room, and when I glanced at her, she looked back at me and then closed the curtains. Now back to the story, I decided to stay put and wait. It occurred to me that I should continue taking pictures. I could hear loud voices as the front door opened, followed by slow footsteps moving toward their car in whispers. What should I do? I took one last picture and headed back to my house. Just as the flash went off, I was petting my cat and that's when I heard her say, Again, that weird chick. Once I closed the door, I burst out laughing. Was it a nervous reaction? Perhaps. I need to find a way to talk to her and reassure her that I'm harmless or maybe I should just embrace being the eccentric neighbor. This was a good six months back. My girlfriend was staying at her parents, so I, a 27-year-old male, was at the flat alone. At around three in the morning, I'm woken up by a loud slam. I quickly jolt up. My bedroom door is wide open and I see a bald man walk straight past my room and into the living room. I must have forgotten to lock the front door that night. I jumped out of bed and immediately my mind made the decision to just stand in front of the front door. I figured there's only one way out and if he's taken anything, I can try and stop him. In my haste, I'd also made the subconscious decision not to put any clothes on so I could get to the door quicker, so I was standing there completely naked. 
not important to the story, just semi-amusing. Anyways, the dude comes stumbling back to the door as a handful of loose cans of Stella Artois cradled in his arms, a half-smoked cigarette in his mouth and a plastic shopping bag hanging from one of his hands. I asked what he was doing in my flat, to which he replied, I'm really sorry, I'm so, so sorry. Though he could hardly get his words out, he was clearly absolutely messed up. I asked him to show me the contents of his bag, which didn't have any of our stuff in, before proceeding to let him out of the flat, locking the door this time. I'm assuming that he was just out of his mind on whatever he had taken and walked into the wrong flat. One funny detail, there was a point where one of the cans slipped out from his grip and he had to bend down to pick it up, making him directly eye level with my bare waist. It was a very awkward moment and I'm sure the poor guy doesn't remember so hasn't completely been scarred. But anyway, I got back into bed and could hardly sleep the rest of the night, my heart absolutely thumping. I will say, it gave me some confidence in my fight or flight response. You never really know what you'll be like in this sort of situation and I was quite proud after the fact that I blocked his exit. I'm perhaps not the most masculine of men so that was some nice affirmation. It's a completely true story by the way and one of the most terrifying moments of my life seeing a stranger casually stroll into my living room in the dead of the night while I'm naked. My dad and I were never very close. I wasn't close to anyone from his side of the family, and his two younger brothers set off every internal alarm I had. Uncle One turned out to be touching his stepdaughter who he raised since she was an infant. Uncle Two, who this post is about, I'll call him D. I have several siblings and we have many cousins living in our small town. They all think D is the best, lots of fun to be around. I never warmed up to him. I didn't trust him and he just had this creepy vibe. I kept my distance and my mom never made me hug or have physical contact with anyone I was leery of. Dee lived next door to him grandma and seemed to always be down with some kind of illness. I was staying with grandma for the day and she was making food for Dee because he was sick. She fixes him a plate and tells me to take it over. I'm not happy about it but I know better than to disobey so I take the food next door. I walk in the door and he yells out and says bring it back there. I walk into his bedroom and set the plate on the wardrobe by the foot of the bed. D says he can't reach it there and to put it on the nightstand next to the bed. I take it and set it on the nightstand and D grabs my arm. I panic and pull away trying to get loose of him. He's pulling me towards him and I brace my foot against the nightstand and resist and saying let me go and he responds. I just want to talk to you and I just say to let me go. I'm ready to detach that hand if necessary and he finally lets go. I bolted out of the house but said nothing to grandma. Later that evening I tell my cousin and she says I'm stupid. He doesn't know why I'm the only kid that doesn't like him and he just wanted to talk to me. I should feel terrible about thinking that he was trying to pull me into his bed. What a terrible thing to say. I didn't mention it to anyone else and began to question if I was wrong and just reacted badly. I felt guilty for a long time but still stayed away from him. As I've gotten older and look back I think my reaction was correct. What adult tries to get a kid to warm up to them by grabbing them and pulling them towards a bed? What adult continues to do this when they can see the child is terrified? You get a child to warm up to you by terrifying them? No. Adults with good intentions don't do these things. We were obedient children. If he would have said, wait, I want to talk to you, I would have obeyed. D passed several years ago and there were rumors of inappropriate behavior with young girls, but nothing more than rumors. But I still believe that I read that situation correctly. My sister always locks her doors. She got a job in the Washington DC area big city after college. She lived alone with her cats during 9-11 and the sniper shootings and she obsessively kept her apartment doors, car doors and windows locked. What are the chances that the one night she left her back door unlocked would be the only night someone would try to get in? Getting tired of the big city stress, she bounced around a bit before settling with her paternal grandparents in southern New Mexico. 
She took care of Grandma, who was going blind, and helped clean the house and run errands while looking for a job. After finding a good job nearby, she was able to purchase her first home. She still helped the grandparents on weekends until Grandma needed a care facility. My sister got herself a little dog to go along with the two cats. One night after taking the dog out for his evening piddle, she locked up and went to bed as usual. She always locked up. She slept deeply until the early morning hours when she heard her toilet flush. Being such a fastidious door locker, she was unprepared for an actual breach of security. Kicking her blankets off, she stumbled anxiously into the kitchen to face her intruder unarmed who just so happened to be a six-foot-tall, 250-pound male. What? Dad? Uh, sorry, I was helping load up Grandpa and Grandma's furniture into the moving truck. I, I got done late and needed a motel before the long drive home, but I, I thought I'd see if you were still up. Your lights were out, but the, the back door was open. I slept on the couch. The little dog whimpered. My sister looked down at his confused face and yelled, you! You're the dog! You're supposed to tell me about these things! The two cats already knew who Dad was and probably snickered behind the dog's back. In all these years, we had never figured out how the back door got left open that one night. The thought that it could have been a stranger is creepy enough to keep her religiously locking her doors, and mine too. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. EST. And there are super fun live streams on Sunday, Tuesdays, and Thursday nights. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial. And you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data. Look at it anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember... Blah, 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 blah.